now get to uh, another uh, technique of sampling bird populations, which is capture mark recapture, which actually involves the capture of these bird species. And you can see this is a grey-sided laughing thrush that has been captured uh, in the past and has been ringed with a numbered aluminium ring. Uh, and so you can identify individuals based on their ring numbers when you recapture them again. And in this case, the bird also has two colored rings. And so if you co color band each bird with a different combination of color rings, you can actually identify individuals even without having to capture them and read the ring number. So capture mark capture is a very, very common uh, prevalent method of estimating uh, various population parameters of uh, bird populations. The commonest technique for catching forest birds, and there are various other techniques for capturing birds like uh, shorebirds and so on, but the commonest technique used for capturing forest birds and forest passerine and songbirds is what is called mist netting. So you're seeing here pictures of two mist nets. These are uh, vertical nets that are placed in the habitat. These particular nets are 12 meters long and two and a half meters high, and they're attached to two poles at uh, two ends of the mist nets. And with the help of guy ropes, these uh, poles are anchored to uh, the ground and the tension of the net and these guy ropes holds the net up vertically. Now each of these nets has a certain mesh size. In this case, the mesh size is 16 millimeters. So every mesh is 16 millimeters uh, square. And uh, some parts of the net actually sag down to form shelves. And so birds actually can't see these uh, uh, mist nets very clearly if they're against a background of vegetation. And so they fly into these mist nets and they get captured within these, uh, within these nets. And once these birds are captured, uh, like this on the left, you see a yellow uh, golden breasted falveta that has been captured in a mist net. They're very, very carefully removed from the mist net and then processed further, you know, with banding and so on. Uh, so the first thing often people do with uh, captures from these mist nets is to use very specialized aluminium rings and specialized banding pliers, uh, different sized aluminium rings for different bird uh, bird species of different sizes. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, this specialized banding plier has uh, holes of different sizes so that you can ring uh, birds of different sizes with different sized rings. And these numbered aluminium rings are uh, placed on the birds. They don't hurt the birds. Uh, they're not harmful. It's like a bangle, like wearing a bangle or a bracelet uh, that these birds are ringed with. And each of these rings, like I said, has a unique number so that if we catch this bird again in the habitat, we know exactly which individual it was, where it was captured previously, etc., etc. But one of the advantages of uh, capturing birds is that it provides you with a lot more information than observational techniques. So because you have the bird with you in the hand, one is with ringing and so on or uh, color banding, you can get an individual identification, you can measure things like uh, body condition through things like body mass, the fat loads that the birds have, the breeding status, whether the bird is breeding or not, based on something called the brood patch, you can look at things like parasite load. Uh, you can see the feather on the right that has a number of feather lice. And so, you know, birds that have poorer body condition tend to have more ectoparasites on them. So you can measure parasite loads, you can measure mold stage, you can measure beak length, tarsus length, etc., etc. There is morphometrics of these birds. For some species, you can tell uh, the age of the bird. And in some cases, you can tell the sex. And if you're interested in, you know, physiology of these birds or you're interested in uh, uh, phylogeography, biogeography, etc., you can collect saliva, feather or blood samples that can then be later analyzed uh, in the lab. And all of these uh, are very, very standard techniques that have been evolved over a lot of time uh, to, to minimize any sort of stress and harm to the birds. And finally, you can get a movement information, right? This is uh, what's on the left is a collared owlet that has caught a uh, gray-sided laughing thrush and uh, the person who took this photograph was actually able to read the ring number on the gray on the gray-sided laughing thrush that had just been killed by this outlet and uh, we looked at the data and uh, realized that uh, this gray-sided laughing thrush was banded at a particular location ringed at a particular location uh, in april 2011 and then killed by this outlet in november 2012 only 40 meters from where uh, it was banded or ringed. And so you can get all this other uh, sort of incidental information from bird captures. 
So once the birds are ringed, they're released, they go out into the habitat, they're, you know, uh, doing what birds do. This is a black-throated parrot bill that has been ringed and then released and uh, it's in the habitat uh, and it, uh, somebody photographed this uh, black-throated parrot bill with a ring on it. Once these birds have been ringed and released, uh, there are two ways in which you can get at population sizes. One is through recapture. So you go back to the same habitat, to the same location, and you put out the nets in exactly the same places and uh, you get recaptures of birds that have been ringed before. Let's say you do this every year, uh, then this bird, particular bird has been ringed in a previous year. It has survived that, uh, that time period between the last netting uh, session and this netting session and it's been recaptured. And based on the number of recaptures and the fresh captures which have not been ringed, you can get all sorts of interesting information about the populations of these birds. Another way is to actually just uh, uh, color band these birds with unique color combinations. So in this case, you have an orange and white on this gray sided laughing thrush. And in fact, you don't need to capture them again because you can just uh, use your binoculars and uh, figure out uh, what individual bird this was and not have to capture these birds again after the initial capture. Uh, here's an example of uh, some of the uh, work that we've been doing in long-term bird monitoring in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, where we have uh, Habitat patches that are primary forest uh, that have not been disturbed before. So there's uh, old growth or primary forest which are outlined in uh, green and then logged forest or degraded forest which are outlined in red. And within each of these plots, we place mist nets in these, in these locations. So every plot you sample for three days and then move on to the next plot, sample that for three days and move on to the next plot and so on and so on. So all the plots are not sampled at the same time. One plot is sampled at a particular time and then we move to the next plot. And we've been doing this, the same locations uh, in the same habitat since 2011. So about 10 years of uh, population dynamics data from these, uh, these uh, plots at 2000 meters in Arunachal Pradesh. The way we do it is this way. So let's say we go to, so this is the way that uh, one way in which you can uh, use mist netting uh, to uh, track populations over time. So if you go every year, so you have a uh, year and the months uh, on the bottom of the line over there and you go in the breeding season, let's say in uh, April and May and uh, for three days you sample the habitat, uh, three consecutive days, you come back the next year in the early breeding season again in April, May, sample the habitat for three consecutive days and so on for every year. and. The way we, the data that are collected is what's called a capture history. So let's say you have a bird which is ringed with the uh, ring number A27047. Uh, that's now an individually identified bird. In the year 2011, it was caught on the first day, caught on the second day and caught on the third day. So if it's caught, it's represented by a one. In 2012, it was caught on the first day, not caught on the second day and caught on the third day and so on. So in 2013 and 14, it was not captured at all, despite three days of uh, sampling in that habitat. It was, we could not capture this uh, bird. And in 2015, in the three consecutive days, it was captured only on the last day. Now, market capture estimates of uh, population size and other population parameters can be divided into what are called closed captures and open captures. Closed captures allow you to estimate population size uh, at a particular time point. So in 2011, if I go out and I capture, uh, figure out, you know, uh, have a capture property for this particular bird and you have multiple capture histories, right, of multiple individual birds, some of which are caught on the first day, caught on the second day, some of which are not caught on the first day. You also have multiple capture histories of multiple birds that are individually identified at a particular point in time, in a particular year, with these three consecutive days, I can assume that the population is not changing. It's not changing either because there are no births happening or no deaths happening. So the population is demographically closed or it's, and it's also geographically closed. So there's no birds leaving that habitat or coming into the habitat. And I can say this is a valid assumption uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, in these three days, there are not going to be massive changes in the population uh, of the bird, right? It's only a three day period. So the uh, population is likely to be what is called closed, both demographically and geographically. And uh, you have a capture history uh, of 101 in this case, which means it's captured on day one and day three, not captured on day two. 
Uh, open captures, on the other hand, are used to estimate not population uh, sizes, but the probability of survival from one year to the next. Here, you, you're using the data of each of those different years and the intervals between these years. And obviously, when you go from 2011 to 2012, some birds would have died, uh, birds would have uh, been born, some birds would have left the habitat, others would have come into the habitat. So the population is open. It's open to additions and uh, subtractions from uh, birth, death, immigration and emigration. And so population size changes over this period. And if you club all the information from those three days in each of those years, you get an open population capture history. In this case, it was captured in year one, captured in year two, not captured in years three and uh, four and captured in year five. So the pop capture history looks like double one, double zero one. So that's a one or a zero for each year of the sampling, depending on whether the bird was captured or not. How do we use closed captures to estimate uh, population sizes? Uh, you have a population of birds in the wild with some unknown population size. This is what you're interested in estimating. You're interested in estimating the size of the population of these uh, bunch of birds. And you have this habitat that you're sampling and population size of these birds, which you don't know, is some value in. What you do is on the first capture occasion, on day one, let's say, you're removing some number of birds from the population, uh, M number of birds that you know here. Uh, so you sample some proportion of this population, right? You're capturing some of these birds uh, out of the total population on the first netting or sampling occasion. Uh, and this some some value m here we know what that value m is we have nine birds from this population that had been captured these nine birds are then ringed with uniquely numbered rings or they are marked and after marking they are released back into the habitat back into the population and they mix with the uh, birds in the population so now you know that there are m birds out of some unknown number n that are in the population of these birds that are m marked or ringed birds in the population uh, over here you come back on the second sampling occasion and some known number of birds are captured again on the second sampling occasion right? in this case uh, small n here n is eight on the second sampling occasion you capture eight birds of those eight two are ringed in the previous sample and six of them are new captures or fresh captures yeah now in this case some number r of these n individuals are uh, recaptures from the first sampling occasion and so here r is equal to two and the assumption is that and here when you released those ringed birds back into the population, resampled the population and you have a certain number of recaptures, then the proportion of these unknown number of birds ringed in sample one should be equal to the proportion of the recaptures in sample two. So therefore M, which is uh, the number of birds captured in the first occasion, nine, divided by the total number of birds in the habitat, which is capital M, which we don't know, is equal to the proportion of recaptures in the second sampling occasion. In the second sampling occasion, we've had eight birds, which is n, and uh, the small n, and the number of recaptures is two. And so n, m by n should be equal to r by n, and so n is equal to mn divided by r, so n is nine times eight divided by two, which is 36, and the actual population of birds is uh, 40. And so this is sort of a brief introduction to how estimating abundance is possible using marked individuals and capture mark recapture in open models on the other hand you're estimating survival rates or estimating what is the probability of a bird surviving from one year to the next so let's say you have a three-year sample 2011 12 and 13 and you have capture histories for five individuals uh, you know these are three to five different uh, birds marked with five different ring numbers and capture histories so for example a270721 uh, was caught in 2011 not in 2012 and then caught again in 2013 a264770 the last bird over here uh, was caught in uh, only in 2013 and not in 2011 and 2012 so you have a capture history separate capture histories for a number of birds in the population 
you cannot tell using this technique whether each individual bird has survived or died but as a population as a whole you can estimate the probability that a bird survives and these capture histories arise from two probabilities the, the whether you get a 101 or a 111 or a 010 etc etc arises from two capture probabilities these are survival and capture probabilities right uh, in 2011 12 and 13 there is a certain capture probability p that you actually capture the bird so for example if there are 10 uh, uh, birds in the habitat and you go out in 2011 and you place your nets in 2011 uh uh in the habitat and you capture four of these nets then capture probability is 0.4 or 40% and so if the time period is associated with a particular capture probability when you place your nets there is a certain probability with which you capture a bird between the time periods there is the probability that the bird actually survives and is available for capture if it dies then there's no capture probability at all right because it's dead it's not available for capture but if it survives with some probability let's say survival probability is 0.7 or 70% it means that if there are 100 birds in the habitat 70% or 70 birds will be alive in the next sampling occasion the next year so there are 100 birds in 2011 and uh, capture uh, survival probability uh, represented by 5 is 0.7 then in 2012 there will be 70 uh, individuals that have survived from the last year to this year and both p and phi range between 0 and 1 they are both probabilities and uh, each of these capture histories is associated with a certain uh, probability for example if you have a 111 then it's the uh, bird has been captured if you have a capture history of 111 the bird has been captured in the first occasion has been captured in the second occasion has been captured in the third occasion and it has lived between occasion 1 and occasion 2 and occasion 2 and occasion 3 and therefore this gives you an overall prop capture probability uh, overall probability of p times p times phi times p times phi and so on and so forth so for every capture probability you can create this uh, this formula of uh, what could give rise to a capture probability like this and we won't get into the details here but every every unique capture probability has this certain formula of p and phi capture probability and uh, uh, survival probability that describes that capture history uh, and and based on that you can estimate phi or uh, the survival rates of these species so based on the capture histories this is uh, our work from arunachal pradesh uh, we are estimating that the survival rates of the uh, white tailed robin has increased from almost 0 to about 80% in primary forest which is the green line there and the survival rates of uh, white tailed robin over the years has increased in logged or degraded forest also but at a much slower pace than it has increased in uh, primary forest so we get uh, a lot of very very valuable information about how the populations of these uh, species are doing uh, in the habitat based on capture mark recapture now that was about sampling bird populations and uh, using these two techniques distance sampling or line transaction point counts and capture mark recapture techniques and uh, you know once you have actually sampled the entire bird community you can now start talking about uh, the properties of the bird community itself so here's an example of uh, uh, line transect data from uh, from arunachal again different species what are the group sizes what is the bearing of the uh, uh, sighting angle what is the distance in meters and so on and based on this and and then analyzing these data we can then get at what are the population sizes of the population densities of each of these uh, uh, different bird species now in these very very diverse habitats uh, that have a lot of bird bird species all species cannot be detected so when you have a very very high species rich community all these birds cannot be detected but what you can do is use rarefaction to estimate how many bird species have been missed the way to do that is to look at the relationship between the number of individuals that you have sighted or captured on the x axis and the cumulative number of species that you're adding uh, on the y axis so when you let's say you're talking about missed netting and capture when you capture the first bird that's the first species that you captured when you capture the second bird it could be of the uh, of a different species or it could be of the same species and and so on and so forth so when you add 
capture more and more individuals. You slowly add more and more species until at a point you've captured all the species in the habitat. And so that line will flatten. So you're seeing that uh, in primary and in log forest, as the number of individuals captured increases, the number of species uh, that we record also increases. But beyond a point, uh, the uh, all the species have been captured. And so the addition of new species individuals in your habitat is not adding any more new species. Based on that relationship, you can uh, determine whether you have adequately sampled the community using the methods that you're using or whether there is the possibility that some of these uh, species have been missed. So if this line plateaus and reaches an asymptote and flattens out, it's likely that all of the species that have been uh, that are in the community have been sampled whereas if the line is still climbing the line is still moving upwards then it's likely that there are still species in the community that are yet to be sampled with the density estimates that you get from either mark capture mark recapture or from distance sampling uh, one can start now comparing communities so let's say you have two habitats uh, habitat a and habitat b let's say that's primary forest and uh, degraded forest so log forest uh, and you have these different species that have different densities per hectare, let's say, in these habitats. So, for example, the second species that acted on Dura agatonae has a much higher density in habitat B than it has uh, a density in habitat A and so on. So now, not only can you compare the densities of individual species, you can start asking, what do these communities look like? You can start comparing communities. One of the ways to do that is by using a rank abundance uh, curve or a rank abundance distribution. Uh, let's say you've got uh, the abundances of these species. So what you do is you create this rank abundance distribution where on the x-axis are the ranks of the species. So the species are arranged in order of their abundance. So the most abundant species is towards the left. And as you go towards the right, the species abundance comes down. The species become rarer and rarer. And what you can see in these two communities in primary and log forest, this is not actual data, this is just uh, uh, just illustrative, is that uh, you see that there are certain species, there is one species, the most common species is extremely common in log forest. It has an abundance of maybe 16 individuals per hectare, but the most common species in uh, primary forest has an abundance of only about eight uh, individuals per hectare. So the distribution of the abundances in primary forest and log forest are very different. You can also see that the number of species in primary forest and log forest are very different. Primary forest has about uh, 40, 43 species, whereas log forest has only 20 species. So just using this curve, uh, we're able to see that primary forest in general, the densities of these birds, the population sizes of these birds are more even, they're more similar to each other than they are in log forest. And this is one way in which you can uh, compare communities and the structure and composition of uh, bird communities using the abundances of these species or the densities of these species. Uh, you can then also compare communities of species in uh, in guilds, uh, functional guilds. For example, we can ask, uh, does the density or the abundance of insectivorous birds differ in a small fragmented patch compared to a large, uh, uh, large forest? And you can see here, for example, that based on the densities that we have of these insectivorous bird species, uh, and we've divided these birds into their feeding guilds, uh, forests in the, the black bars have higher densities of uh, insectivores uh, than forest fragments, which are small isolated patches of forest uh, and so on and so forth. So you can use the density and the abundance estimates in uh, many ways to start comparing bird communities, bird guilds, bird assemblages uh, across different types of habitats, across time, etc., etc. Uh, final thing is uh, representing community composition and uh, one of the ways to do this is something called an NMDS, a non-metric multidimensional scale. I won't get into the uh, details of this, but this is a plot that is showing you the composition of mixed species bird flocks at different elevations in the Himalayas. So every dot is a mixed species bird flock. And the dot, location of the dot in this space, in this square, the location of the dot depends on which species 
and the number of individuals of each species that were present in the next species flock. So two dots that are very close to each other have more similar composition of uh, these mixed species flocks than two dots that are very, very far away. So two dots that are very far apart from each other are less similar in the composition of their uh, uh, flocks than two dots that are very, very close to each other. And you can see that, for example, there is a large amount of overlap between uh, the flocks at 800 meters and 1200 meters, so that each of these ellipses sort of uh, tells you what is the space occupied by the composition of these different mixed flocks at different elevations. So there is some overlap between flocks at 800 meters and 1200 meters because some of the species are shared at those two elevations. But because the species are completely different at 800 meters and 2800 meters, there is absolutely no overlap between uh, the flock compositions at these two elevations. So uh, getting at uh, using these flocks as you know, mini communities, uh, you can quantify uh, actual community composition. I've just used flocks as, a, as an example of a small community of birds, but you can actually quantify the composition of these communities at different sites and see how similar or how far apart, uh, how, how different they are based on approaches like this. So again, to recap, there are uh, several different ways in which one can measure the population sizes and survival rates and so on of birds. But the choice of these approaches, whether you want to use line transits or point counts, whether you want to use market capture uh, or distance sampling is very dependent on uh, the, the, the bird species that you're looking at, the habitat that you're looking at, and so on. So I'll end here. This is uh, about uh, studying bird populations and bird communities. Thank you very much.